In the early 1800s, most of the steam was being used for railway engines and in industry. Very little thought had been given to its application in terms of agriculture. And in order to get it more widely known amongst farmers and industrialists, farmers club was started, the Royal Agricultural Society was started and these were able to put on shows and trials all around the country where many, many experimental engines were being tested. Before steam was widely used on farms, all of the work would have had to have been done by hand with the aid of horses and with oxen prior to that. The horses were used to pull things like the ploughs to provide the power and the mechanised type of seed drills. Horses took over from oxen around the early part of the 1800s and were still used on many farms right up until the end of the Second World War when tractors took over. One man with a pair of horses could plough about an acre a day and this would mean walking about 13 miles. Most farmers used shire horses, but there were several regional breeds popular in their local areas. Suffolk punches, like these horses for example, were used in East Anglia, and Clydesdales were used in the Clyde Valley in Scotland. Most of the ploughs were pulled by two, three or four horses, and ploughed either one or two furrows. Ploughing stubble after a corn harvest would usually mean working down to about four inches deep, but for root crops, the ploughs would go down to about 10 inches. Horse-drawn seed drills were often used to sow the new crop. The wheels of the drill have to drive its mechanism, which makes them very hard work to pull. The discs, or coulters, cut a slot into the seed bed where the seeds are planted, about an inch to an inch and a half deep. Before ploughed land can be drilled, it was usually harrowed to break down the lumps of soil into a fine seed bed. This is fairly light work and the horses can cover up to about 10 acres a day. After drilling, smaller, even lighter harrows were often used to smooth over the seed bed to make sure the seeds were properly buried and to cover the hoof prints and the wheel tracks. In terms of threshing, the farmer would have had to have had a gang with flails in the early days. These would be a long wooden stick with a shorter wooden stick tied to the end with leather. And these were lifted above the head and then beaten down onto the ground to separate the um, wheat from the the wheat seed from the ears of corn and this would have been carried out on the barn floor with the doors open to create the draught to remove the chaff. Horse-drawn threshing using a mechanical threshing drum was far more productive than hand flails. The first of these machines, which was used in the late 1700s, were big and cumbersome, but smaller, portable versions were soon developed. All of them used a series of gears and shafts to connect the horse to the drum. This meant that a horse, walking slowly, could drive a drum at thousands of revolutions a minute. This drum separated the grain and chaff from the straw. The straw was thrown out at one end and the grain at the other. As farmers demanded more and more output from these drums, larger versions were made which had to be driven by up to four horses. But this wasn't ideal because it was very difficult to get steady power from a team of horses. Fortunately, by the 1840s, an alternative power source was just beginning to look promising. Many experiments were made with steam to introduce it into farm work to help provide mechanisation. And with the early days, the engines were portable engines, and that doesn't mean that you could pick it up and carry it. It was basically an engine on four wheels that could be moved from farm to farm or around the farm and would have been pulled by horses. These teams of horses pull the portable engines, like this one, down the small country roads. But 
When it came to lining the engines up accurately enough to drive a belt, in this case onto a threshing drum, the engines had to be manhandled into the exact position. The engines weighed several tons and could take a long time to set up on muddy or uneven ground, but they were an ideal source of constant steady power. A few stationary steam engines had been used to power agricultural machinery before these portable engines arrived, but they were so big and cumbersome they had to be permanently bolted to barn floors. They were also enormously expensive, so only very large, wealthy estate owners could afford them. The very first portable engine was shown to farmers at the 1841 Royal Show in Liverpool by a company called R.J. and A. Ransom. Other companies soon developed their own models and by the 1850s farmers were being offered a wide choice. It wasn't a big step to develop the portable engine into a traction engine, a mobile, self-propelled steam engine. A variety of designs were tried out during the 1840s and 50s, but by the early 1860s most manufacturers had settled on one which was to remain almost unchanged for the next 60 years. These are the traction engines we recognise today. Many of the companies which developed the traction engines were centred in East Anglia and Lincolnshire mainly because of the um, land of this area. This is where most of the arable farming was. Companies like Ransoms of Ipswich and Borrells of Thetford, Garrets of Leyston, and up in Lincolnshire there were Marshalls of Gainsborough, Robies, Rustons, all centred around Lincoln. These companies were actually um, producing most of the engines in this country and were in fact exporting engines worldwide. Traction engines were far too heavy and cumbersome to pull farm machinery around fields, so horses were used to pull equipment like corn cutters and binders until tractors eventually took over. Even in the 1920s and 30s, where many farmers were using tractors for cutting corn, some threshing drums were still being driven by steam traction engines. The corn was usually cut just before it was fully ripe. This meant that not too many of the grains fell out of the crop as it was being handled. The first reapers were developed in the 1830s and they soon started to take over from harvesting with scythes. These early machines simply cut the corn and the crop had to be raked off the blade by hand. Bunches were then developed which gathered the cut corn into sheaves which by the 1880s were being automatically tied with string. The sheaves were then stooked so the air could get round them until they were dry and they were often out in the fields for several weeks. Most farmers would then use a horse and cart to take the sheaves to the farmyard where they'd be stacked until threshed. When the wheat was all gathered in and stacked, the most important part of the, the farmer's year would be threshing and the threshing would be done with a steam powered threshing drum with the power being taken off of the flywheel to drive the drum. This development actually saved a lot of labour. The threshing tackle was either owned by a fairly wealthy farmer in which case it would just work on the farms that he owned or it would be owned by a contractor. These contractors used to travel around the farms taking the thrashing tackle behind them at around four miles an hour. The traction engine
pulling the thrashing tackle, which would probably comprise a thrashing drum, a straw elevator, a chaff cutter perhaps, and a baler, would all come in one long procession into the village. When the thrashing tackle came into the village, it caused a great deal of excitement. It could be heard rumbling away, the gears ringing for many miles, and so children always knew, could hear when it was coming, and would sometimes uh, run out of school just to see the engine arriving, and even taking time off from their uh, school lessons to go along and perhaps help with the engine if they were allowed. Sometimes the, one of the children's father might be the engine driver, and so they would be allowed to get involved in some of this work. Well, uh, I worked for a firm called W.J. Ford and Sons, and they were agricultural engineers of a place called West Row, and they was well there was also uh, thrashing machine proprietors too and they had three traction engine sets and a portable set the uh, traction engine sets used to do the work on the highland and the portable set used to do the work on the on the fenland well we used to uh, travel with the traction engine and the traction engine was pulling the drum and the elevator behind Sometimes we used to pull a chaff box behind, but not very often. But most of my work, what i done, was in the fen. And at that time, the fen was very, very soft. Well, when we got in the yard, we first of all, we used to have a look around and see where the stacks were, unhook the uh, elevator off the drum, and then run and, and pull the drum in between the two stacks, the drum had got a spirit level on the back and on the side and used to set it as level as you could get. And then while we were setting the drum and setting the engine, well the rest of the team used to handle, pull the, uh, uh, the straw pitcher around by hand and they used to set that. And so by the time we got the belt on everybody was ready to go. Because you see we'd got to get, we'd got to get the wheels to turn as quick as we could because until they started, we wasn't earning any money. After the straw elevator had been unhitched, the traction engine would manoeuvre the threshing drum into position. Either a horse or a gang of men would then pull the elevator up to one end of the drum, where it would catch the thresh straw and carry it away. While this was happening, the traction engine would be driven into position at the other end of the drum. The traction engine, drum, an elevator would then be in a long line ready for the belts to be connected and thrashing to start. Each piece of equipment would have to be lined up very accurately to make sure that the pulleys were exactly opposite each other. The elevator carries the thresh straw away from the drum and underneath the far end of the elevator the farmer could put either a baler, buncher or chaff cutter. This is a baler. It compresses the straw into large bales which were stored to be used during the winter as animal bedding. The buncher gathers the straw into bunches without damaging it so that it can be used for thatching. And the chaff cutter cuts the straw into small pieces which were fed to animals. Some of the straw processing machinery was driven from the threshing drum while others were powered from a second traction engine. During the autumn, the threshing gangs would usually thresh just one or two stacks from each of the farms in the area, so that all the farmers would be able to start the winter with at least some grain in store. They then returned to finish the rest of the harvest later in the season.
Well, when we got the engine and drum lined up and got the driving belt on, we used to test the old engine for speed, and we always used to reckon that uh, 170 revolutions was a, m uh, a minute was about the right speed. And to test that, we used to hold a finger on top of the crank, and every time the crank went round, we used to count one, and count that for a half a minute, and then double it up. And by doing that, uh, that would give you a drum speed then of about 1,025,050, which was the speed that we wanted. And, uh, well, that used to work very, very well. Horse carts were sometimes used to carry the sheaves of corn to the threshing drum, especially if they were being threshed directly from the field rather than from the stack. There used to be two men on the corn stack, one man seeing after corn, a drum feeder and a band cutter on the actual thrashing machine, and two men on the straw stack, and a boy probably seeing after chaff. That was the gang, apart from the engine driver who was sort of in charge of everything else. Although the bales of straw are compressed automatically by these balers, the wires holding them together had to be threaded round and tied by hand. Well, the thrashing season at that time of day used to start about the first week in August and then we used to go on what they call harvest hours that was work on 7 till 7 well we used to work from 7 till half past 8 and from half past 8 till 9 was breakfast and then from quarter to 11 to 11 we used to stop for beer and uh, 1 till 2 for dinner and then we'd thrash on then till about four o'clock, four o'clock to quarter past, we had another glass of beer, and then carry right on till seven o'clock at night. Well, as regards food, I mean, my wife, she used to pack me up three meals a day. That was breakfast, dinner, and tea. And uh, that meant that you used to leave home about, well, a little four, six in the morning, and you was home about eight o'clock at night, so that was a pretty long day. But that carried out that, we, what we used to call harvest hours used to uh, last for about six weeks and then we used to go on to uh, ordinary working hours which was from seven till five. The grain falls out of the threshing drum down chutes directly into sacks. The weight of every sack was checked before being carried away. The threshing drum could be adjusted to thresh most crops being grown in Britain at the early part of this century. Well, the main things that we used to thresh was oats, barley and wheat. A comb of oats was 12 stone, and a comb of barley was 16 stone, and a comb of wheat was 18 stone, and a comb of peas was 21. In my day, when I was thrashing, 12 comb an acre of barley was thought to be a very good crop, and 8 to 10 comb of wheat was a good crop. And when we were thrashing, we used to reckon on uh, doing somewhere about 100 comb a day. And by the time we'd done that 100 comb, everybody had enough of it. They, they were pretty well all knocked up.
as the threshing team got nearer the bottom of the stack you could very often see the bottom of the stack actually heaving and this would be because it was full of rats and mice that had made their home in there quite often you'd see upwards of a hundred rats in one stack and it's quite a sight a netting would be put around the thrashing tackle to try and keep these rats in and it would be the job of children people with sticks even with dogs um, to try and catch the rats so that they didn't spread into the surrounding area. It was quite a sport at the end of the day and children even got paid at the local school by how many rats' tails they could take into their teacher the next day. The threshing gangs were actually paid on piecework therefore it was directly related to the amount of productivity. If there happened to be a few wet days in a week, then they didn't get any money at all. And the other thing we have to remember is that thrashing work was seasonal. It tended to be throughout the winter months, and therefore these people would have to find themselves other employment during the summer. They might perhaps go and help on the fields with the harvest, or some of them might even have been employed to help maintain the tackle, but for some of them it did actually mean a term of unemployment. Well, I suppose the happy memories were that uh, everybody worked as a team and uh, everybody was pulling everybody else's leg and having a laugh and a joke and that was the good part about it but the bad part about it was you was up early in the morning and you didn't get home till late at night and uh, if that was wet you was half wet through and when you were setting up and if the weather was very bad there'd be somebody standing behind the engine and they'd say well you want to be over another six inches well you knew where you wanted to be but you couldn't get there because they had to, they had to go back into the same rut every time so that was the, the bad part about it but I had a, a friend who was a steam plow driver and we was at a rally one day and somebody said to him Ridge what was the best thing you liked about steam, uh, steam plowing he said putting the cloth on on a Saturday night A wide range of equipment, including saw benches, were driven by traction engines. They sometimes took over from wind or water power and at other times from horses or humans. Before steam, for example, timber planks would usually be cut by two men working with an enormous two-handed saw. One worked from in a pit underneath the trunk and the other worked from on top of the trunk. Saw benches powered by traction engines, revolutionised this. Jibs could be fitted to the front of many traction engines to convert them into cranes. This was especially useful for heavy haulage companies and factories, but farmers involved in forestry also found them useful. One of their drawbacks was that even without a load, the weight of the jib made steering very heavy. The other main impact of steam on agriculture was in ploughing and many experiments were made in the 1860s and before that to try and perfect a system of ploughing using engines. One of the early versions was to try and drive a traction engine across the field and in fact Burrells along with Boydells patented an engine that had these huge uh, type of, well they were called elephant's feet, strapped around their wheels to try and spread the load. These engines moved across the field and would actually have towed probably 
um, four or five horse-drawn ploughs behind them. They weren't desperately successful as they were very heavy on the land and tended to compact the soil. Another system of ploughing was invented by fowlers of Leeds. First of all, with a roundabout system of ploughing, which meant they had one engine stationary on the field and a system of capstans and pulleys pulling a plough or a cultivator across the field. The Fowler two-engine system of ploughing meant that there was an engine placed at either end of the field. These engines had large winding drums underneath them full of wire rope and they would pull a cultivator or a plough or a mould drainer up and down the field between them and each time they pulled the cultivator or plough one way then the engine would move along a section so that the next piece of land could be ploughed. This was by far the most successful method and was patented by Fowlers in the 1860s. The ploughing tackle was actually owned by contractors and would comprise two engines, a pair of ploughing engines, a plough and a cultivator, a water cart and a living van and this equipment was towed behind the engines and towed from farm to farm um, at a speed of about four or five miles an hour. When they arrived on the farm they would then set up camp and the living van was a very important part of this equipment because the workers will probably be away from home from Monday till Saturday lunchtime. Well, it was chiefly done by contractors and they varied. Some would have three or four sets, some half a dozen, and and some of them had over 20 sets, some of the big firms. And uh, they would employ all their gangs to go around to the different farms. Each gang had their own area as a rule. They'd never run over each other's plots. And uh, we'd, we'd go from farm to farm in our own plot. But a lot of the big farmers, they had their own tackle, the same with the big estates. And they employed their own men, of course, and paid them. When you arrived at the field that you were going to plough or cultivate or whatever was happening, you'd get your tackle inside. The living van was the main thing. The implements that you weren't going to use, you'd pull them off on the side of the road at the nearest road point or in the farmyard or wherever it was. That you weren't going to use them. they stay there till you went away. You'd get what implement you were going to use into the field, which was near, by the nearest gateway or whatever it was. Then the one engine is set to the side of the field that he's going to work and the other one that's got to go across the other side. You'd open the rope from the first one onto the back of that engine and he'd take it right across the field. You line your other engine up in line with the other one on the opposite side of the field, couple the two ropes together, a couple of glass on your whistle and he'd pull that back and that's back to wherever the plough or cultivator was, ready to hook onto the two and you're ready to go. The two ploughing engines work on opposite sides of the field, pulling the plough or cultivator backwards and forwards between them. After each pull, the engine moves forwards about six feet, the working width of the implement. The driver then has just a few minutes to check the water level, the fire, and fill up if necessary before he needs to start the next pull.
For a steam plough gang, there's five. That is the foreman, two drivers, a cultivator man and a cook boy. The foreman, while you were cultivating, he would be round the farms getting jobs. He'd wear on his bike, spend half a day in the pub perhaps and then on <laughs> round some of the farms and come back and say, well, we're going so and so next week and all that. The two drivers, they were tied up with their engines, of course. The cultivator man, he would be looking after the cultivator and steering it while we were working. And the cook boy would keep the gang fed and look after the living man and keep that clean and tidy, which was we were always pretty particular about. Our wages were drawn from the um, firm that we were working for normally, but one firm that I worked for, where I finished up steam ploughing, which was Wards of Egham in Surrey, he had an agreement with all the farmers that when we pulled in to do a job, we would draw the money from the farm for the wages, which was £9 for a gang of five <laughs> for the week. <laughs> and I always remember we went to one place in a little village called Bradfield, which is about eight miles west of Reading. And the farmers in those days, they were really hard up. And my brother was in charge of the set. That was the first year I was with Wards at Egham. And uh, when we pulled in there, my brother went over and he said, all right for nine pounds for the wages at the weekend, Mr. Wilson. This was on the Tuesday. He said, I'm going to Reading Market tomorrow with some calves. If they fetch a good price, you can have nine pounds. If they don't, you won't get any, he said, just like that. <laughs> they were running on a shoestring, most of the farmers then. The centre pivot plough was usually used for ploughing. A set of plough bodies are carried on each half of the V-shaped frame. After ploughing across a field one way, the plough is tilted to bring the other bodies down. It then sets off back across the field. The driver was responsible for the lives of the men on the plough. It wasn't unknown for a plough to appear out of the early morning mist without the ploughman. Even when the visibility was good, it could be difficult for the engine driver to see what was happening at the far end of the field because the two engines could be working up to half a mile apart. Well, you, we generally pull out from the yard round about the end of March or April, beginning of April, and that was nearly all cultivating then. And the ploughing would come in in the autumn after the harvest was off, and you'd plough and press chiefly. We had a press on the side of the plough, and they'd broadcast the corn, and then you see that there's the winter corn. We'd plow it ready for the winter corn, see. Plowing, you can see each furrow. Cultivating is just scuffled up and it's... Mind you, you can go down deeper with a cultivator than you can with a plow and it still does a good job. Cultivating, you could do 30 acres in a day. Plowing, 20 acres is a good day's work. They were full days too, not like the time. <laughs> Half the time, it was a full day, about 16 hours. Well, on a Monday morning, if they'd been stood idle over the weekend, which wasn't very often, 
we always had a bundle of wood by us and you'd light the fire up and that would take just over an hour to get steam up ready to start work if you'd been working all day you, you would bank down the fire say when, when you packed up about 10 o'clock or whatever time it would be you push in three or four great big knobs of coal as much as you could get through the fire hall door they were big knobs in those days not like we get now <laughs> and a uh, few shovels of dust on the top drop the ash band damper and a damper over the chimney at the top and that'd be all right then you'd go out the next morning and say we're well, generally about up past three four o'clock we'd be away There was a real hierarchy amongst the ploughing gang. The foreman, obviously at the top, would be responsible for going out and negotiating the next day's work on the rates of pay. The two engine drivers, then the ploughman and then the cook boy. Quite often the cook boy aspired to be an engine driver and thought himself very fortunate if he was in fact allowed to look after an engine for any amount of time. It varied in the ploughing gangs as to who actually got up first. In some gangs the cook boy would go out first and see to the fires on the engines and make sure that they were either still alight from the night before or relit for that day. Usually they would keep the fires in and so they would just need stirring up and coaling up ready to be getting up steam for the next day's work. In some gangs the cook boy would actually get up last and while the engine drivers were out seeing to the fires in their engines then the cook boy would be cooking the breakfast. Once the breakfast was ready they would actually eat it in relays so that the ploughing tackle kept going for as long as possible throughout the day. They were being paid on piecework and so it was to their advantage not to stop work or at least for as short a time as possible. The cook boy would also be responsible for getting the food supplies and would often be sent out to the local shops to get the various types of food required by the gang. It didn't always follow that they would all want the same food and he would therefore sometimes have to provide different meals for the different members of the gang. Well, we start off from home <coughs> on a Monday morning or Sunday evening, whichever it was, how far we had to go. If it was too far to go, you start off on the Sunday evening. You'd take some fresh food with you, you know, like a couple of loaves or what have you, because when you were out in the country, the shops in those days were few and far between, and you had a long way to go to get anything. But we often had a cook-up. We had a cook boy, you see, and uh, you'd have a cook-up, whatever you could get. We lived chiefly off the farms. You would always get a few potatoes and green stuff and what have you. The odd rabbit, there was, we know it's a set of rabbits near. <laughs> and that was a luxury, of course. Well, it was a hard life, really. If you'd go off from home on a Monday, early Monday morning or late Sunday evening, ready for the next week, <coughs> you might get home the following weekend and you might not. It just depends what work came up you'd probably be working the whole of the weekend and I've been away for a fortnight and three weeks at a time on the end of that three weeks you get a bit scruffy you haven't had a bath you're plastered with oil and coal dust most of the day and you know you were glad to get home to get a bath and get some clean clothes on it was really hard work you know it's about 16 hours a day but the thing that worried me most was my eyesight because you stand on one of those engines for about 16 hours on a hot day you're plastered with oil from two high speed big ends and everything else that goes with it ashes from the chimney, dust from the field and you go in at night and you just can't see you have a wash the best you can in a bucket of water outside out from one of the injectors of the engine you fall into bed dog tired the old beds weren't much, they were just straw filled mattresses they were hard as rock, but you could always sleep because you were dog tired. And about half past three, four o'clock in the morning, that was it. You were out again the next day. <laughs> and I said, you went on. It wasn't an easy life, really. But 
it didn't do me any harm. <laughs> Here I am, just turned 18 and still ticking over nicely, <laughs> so it didn't do me any harm at all. Well, this was uh, our home while we were away on the, on the ploughing jobs. They weren't too comfortable, really. The beds weren't much to shout about, but the foreman would be that end. That was his quarters. This end, there's the two bunks. The two drivers would be on the bottom, and the cultivator man and the cook boy on the top one. And any time after about half past three or so in the morning, the foreman would be there and he'd thumping on the boards, come on, let's have it. And we'd be out, the two drivers away across the other side of the field to get the engines ready. The cook boy would be boiling the kettle and getting the breakfast ready. We'd come back, have a cup of tea and a breakfast and away for another day's hard work. The cupboards up there, we, we had one each of those. And I always remember one bloke that I worked with, Wilder at Wallingford, he would always sit that end and cut a slice off of his loaf and he'd open the door and he'd roll it back in and slam the door up so it didn't fall out. <laughs> he'd never pack it up tight, he'd just roll it back in the cupboard and slam the door at the same time. But if you leave those doors open, so you forget yourself when you get up, you get a crack on the head a bit rapid with that. You always remembered the cupboards because you, you leaned forward every time you got up. But if somebody left the door open, it was a different story and it wasn't very pleasant. The stoves we used to cook cook most of our meals on, if the weather was bad we would do it all in here. Very often if it was a real warm summer evening those doors would be wide open all the time, both of them. We'd just sleep with the doors wide open. They weren't too bad really, it was reasonably comfortable. You had somewhere to lay down, that, that was the main thing which you were glad of after about 16 hours hard slogging. The enormous power and torque of traction engines makes them ideal for slow winching jobs like timber hauling. Most engines have a winch and wire rope tucked behind the left hand wheel. At one time horses were used to pull felled trees out of the woods and onto trailers, often called timber tugs. This was exhausting and dangerous work for both the men and the horses. Steam was therefore a welcome replacement. After the drive pins have been removed, the wheels are no longer connected to the flywheel. The traction engine is now ready for winching. Up to 70 yards of steel wire is usually carried. If the trunk has to be pulled further than this, it could take several separate pulls up to 70 yards each time. Only with very light trunks and solid ground would it be possible for a traction engine to drive along pulling the timber behind it. Large tree trunks can weigh up to 20 tonnes each, but if you know the secret, it's quite easy to load them onto the tug.
The early traction engines were the start of one of the greatest revolutions in farming. Traction engines were used from the 1860s right through to the 1920s and 30s when tractors began to take over.